we're good to start. Do you guys like the lights like this? Is that good? Yes? Is it loud enough in the back? It's hot in here, isn't it? Yeah, okay, but the volume is good. All right, click in if you're gonna, because I'm gonna close it. All right, let's see what you guys think. Yay! You guys are just as good as section A, which is good because people miss this question on the exam all the time. I taught genetics, the class that happens in this room a few hours earlier for seven years. People have always miss this, so don't forget the answer by exam time. So because we're switching instructors, there's a couple of quick business things I wanted to go over as we get started. So the first one is, I want to encourage you guys to interrupt me with questions during class. If I say something that doesn't make sense, I might have said something wrong. It's going to be impossible for me not to make any mistakes in 15 lectures. And if you're confused, then somebody else is confused. Always. So please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. I would like to encourage you, <clears throat> in the next few sections, things can get a little complex. I think it will help you a lot if you look over the material before class. If you are pressed for time, at least look at the pictures and read the captions. That will give you a good flavor for what you're going to hear about. Use your glossary and your dictionary. So if I use any words in class and you don't know what they mean, you have to look them up. Because the only way to do well in the exam is to understand the question that we're asking. So you need to know exactly what the science words mean as well as the English language words because you might see them again later. I will answer questions after class outside there every day except Monday when there's office hours. So if you can't make office hours, you can stop by outside. I wanted to also take an opportunity to tell you guys how I studied as an undergraduate. So when I was in classes like these, I would record the lecture because people didn't do it for us back then. So I recorded it myself. And each night I would go home and recopy my lecture notes. And as I was recopying them, I would redraw the diagrams. I would try and do it from memory. For you guys, we hand you a PowerPoint. But if you guys try and redraw what's on the PowerPoint, it will help you learn. After recopying my lecture notes, I would go back to the recording I made and listen to it at twice the normal speed to fix anything that I had questions with. Then I would review the previous two lectures. So you guys are mostly full-time students, which means you should spend at least 40 hours a week on academic pursuits. Okay? So this class is four units, which means 10 to 12 hours. You're in class four hours. That means two to three hours out of class for every hour you're in class. The students who do well in this class are the students who put in the time. So if you maybe aren't spending as much time as you should be, that would be one way to help you learn the material. But we also want to think about ways we can help you learn the material better. The mean on the midterm was lower than we wanted, so we're interested in trying different approaches to see how they will help you. So I want to get your feedback on a couple of questions. So the first one is, if you had more time, oh, well, I should say, is this statement, how would you respond to the statement? I would perform better on the online quizzes if I had a few more minutes to, to complete them. So not if you want a few more minutes, but would you do better if you had a few more minutes? Yes, definitely, maybe, or probably not. Go ahead and click in if you haven't. Okay, let's see what you think. All right, so most of you guys would like a little bit more time. And I thought that you guys might want a little more time, so we're going to give you a little more time to do the quizzes. Please use that time wisely. I think it will help you. Decrease stress. Oops, I didn't mean to start that. Okay, so the second question. Now you can click in. Change it if you answered the wrong one. So, would more practice solving challenging problems improve your performance on the exam? Yes, you're confident that it would, maybe, or probably not. Okay, I'm going to close the polling, so click in. Okay, what do you think? 
So most of you would like more practice solving harder problems. And that's what I thought. So the quiz I wrote for this lecture is a little bit harder. It's based on some old exam questions. <laughs> so let me explain. We're going to give you a little bit more time, and we're going to give you a little bit harder questions. And listen to my logic. When you take a quiz and you get a question wrong, how much does it cost you? Point one point. OK? You have to get only half of the quiz questions right to get all the quiz points. If you miss that question on exam, it counts 20 times more. It's two points on an exam, point one point on a quiz. So if you practice more problems on the quiz that are harder, don't look at it as punishment. It's training, OK? And I'm going to ask you again in a week, are they too hard? Are they helpful? Do you need more time? And you can give me feedback. But I would like to try this and see if it works better. So they're not like horribly hard or anything. They're just a little bit more challenging than basic recall. All right. So today, we're doing the second half of the divided cell unit. We're going to talk about meiosis. And the problem that we were addressing is how you pass your genetic information on to your progeny. Dr. O'Dad talked to you on Wednesday about one strategy, which is mitosis. If you use mitosis, you can divide by asexual reproduction. You can produce a clone of yourself. So you would go from diploid to diploid when you divide by mitosis. And in general, you know, the individuals that have the resources to reproduce probably have pretty good DNA, right? So making a clone of yourself might seem like a pretty good idea, a good way to reproduce. But there are times when making a clone of yourself might not be such a good idea. So if the environment is changing, the particular combination of genes that you have, of alleles that you have, may not be as good in the new environment. It may be by mixing it up a little bit, getting some new DNA, you may be able to produce progeny that are more fit for the new situation. So that's one, one good reason. Another one is nobody's perfect. And so by mixing up your DNA with somebody else, if you find a good person, you might end up with children that have the ability to succeed in areas that you, you could not. So if you want to come up with new gene combinations, mix your DNA with somebody else's, you need to have a new strategy for dividing a cell, and that's meiosis. So meiosis allows sexual reproduction to happen. Because the challenge of sexual reproduction is you need to have a mechanism to give your progeny half of your genes. When the cell divides by mitosis, it goes from diploid to diploid. But when you're going to make gametes, you need to go from diploid to haploid. You need to have half as much DNA in your gamete so that when that gamete mixes with another gamete, you go back to diploid offspring. So we need a new way to divide the cell that will reduce the DNA content and mix up the genes. And that's meiosis. So you may, some of you recognize these images. These are from one of my favorite movies of all time, The Princess Bride. And in this movie, Buttercup and Wesley had to face the R-O-U-S's. So those are rodents of unusual size. And in bottom 93, in our swamp here, we have V-O-U-I's. And that's a vocabulary of unusual importance. So this slide is here to remind me to tell you guys, make sure you understand exactly what these words mean. Not sort of generally what they mean, but exactly. Because if you underestimate them and their importance, then they may do to your grave what the ROUSs have done to, to Wesley's arm. So first, I'm going to go through the vocabulary, then I'm going to give you an example, then I'm going to ask you some clicker questions for you to practice applying the material. So the first very important term here is gene. A gene is a unit of heredity. So generally, this is a piece of DNA that's associated with a phenotype. Oftentimes, genes are converted into protein, and the protein gives us the phenotype. But sometimes, DNA is act is has a phenotype and it's converted to RNA. So sometimes it doesn't have to go all the way to protein. But our definition of a gene is it's a piece of DNA that's associated with a phenotype. An allele, this is what trips people up most of the time, is one version of a gene. So a gene is a DNA sequence. 
You and I have the same genes. We all have the same 20,000 genes. But the sequence of our genes is not identical. So the gene that I have may have a slightly different sequence than the allele that I have may have a slightly different sequence than the allele that you have. So small changes in the sequence of the DNA are what make it an allele. The locus is the address or the physical position where you find the gene on a chromosome. So here is my example. This is the hypothetical favorite ice cream flavor locus. So this particular gene controls what your favorite ice cream flavor is. And its locus is found on chromosome 12. So here's 12. This is the physical position where the gene is on the chromosome. Because we're diploid, we have a homologous chromosome pair. So we have two copies of chromosome 12. One that I got, or you got, or this person got from their mom, and one from the dad. So at this locus, we find the favorite ice cream flavor gene. This person has two different alleles. It got a chocolate allele from the maternal chromosome. So that's a variant of this gene that makes people like chocolate. And on the paternal chromosome, there's an allele that makes you like strawberry. So this individual has two different alleles of the favorite ice cream flavor gene. This person also has two alleles of the favorite ice cream flavor gene, but they have two of the same allele. They got a green tea allele from the mom and a green tea allele from the dad. So they have two alleles, but they happen to be the same. That's okay. So a term that we picked up on that slide was homologous chromosomes, and Dr. O'Dowd introduced that again on Wednesday. Homologous chromosomes contain the same genes in the same order. One of the homologous chromosomes came from mom and one came from dad. A genome is a complete set of the organism's genes. So humans have 20,000 genes. Those are encoded by 3 billion base pairs of DNA. So in each of the nuclei of each of our somatic cells, there are 6 billion base pairs of DNA because we have two copies of the genome. Every somatic cell in your body has two copies of the genome, two alleles of every gene because we are diploid, two copies of every gene. But so far, yes? That's a good question. So the question was, how many different genetic loci are on each chromosome? It varies. The longer the chromosome is, the more genetic loci, the more genes it's going to have. So uh, chromosome 1 has 1,000 genes, something like that. So in general, if you have 23 different chromosomes and 20,000 genes, they have around 1,000 genes per chromosome. Anybody else? OK. So now I have a clicker question for you. Identify the pair of homologous chromosomes. Do you think it's A, B, or both A and B? You guys are doing slightly better than the previous section. Click in if you have it. Okay. <laughs> so it's a pretty even split, but the right answer is C. Okay, let's talk about why. So a homologous pair of chromosomes, in this case, they're representing G1 chromosomes before they've been replicated. So you have a pair of chromosomes. You have one centromere, two centromere two chromosomes, together they make a homologous chromosome pair. Then the cell undergoes DNA replication, and now you have two sister chromatids that are hooked together at the centromere. So there's two centromeric sequences, but you can't distinguish them. There's really only one centromere that you can see on this replicated chromosome. So now we have one chromosome here, one centromere structure, well, two sequences, one structure. So one centromere here, one centromere here. So again, you still have only two chromosomes. You have twice as much DNA, but you still have two chromosomes. So you still have a pair of homologous chromosomes. 
We have this term sister chromatids that was introduced on Wednesday. So sister chromatids are the chromatids that are linked by this centromere structure. So the sister chromatids would be this side and this side. So one single chromosome is made up of the two sister chromatids. We have a new term which is non-sister chromatids. So non-sister chromatids are not connected by a centromere. They're on opposite chromosomes, opposite homologous chromosomes. So non-sister chromatids are on different chromosomes. This is to go over kind of similar ideas. It's a picture from your book. It may look a little bit different, but these are, again, replicated chromosomes. So over here, you have one sister chromatid. Then on this side, connected at the centromere, you have another sister chromatid. Over here, you have the homologous chromosome. This chromatid and this chromatid are non-sister chromatids. So for these non-sister chromatids, do they have the same genetic loci? Yes. 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 They have the same genetic loci. Are they in the same order? Yes, you see the banding pattern is the same. The same genetic loci in the same order. Do they have the same genes? Yes. Yes, yes they have the same genes. Many people get tripped up there. They have the same genes. Do they have the same alleles? No. no. Non-sister chromatids have different alleles of the same gene. Sister chromatids, before crossing over, are exactly the same. Same alleles. Same loci, same genes, same alleles. Non-sister chromatids, same loci, same genes, different alleles. Any questions? OK, so the thing I forgot to say was these are metaphase chromosomes. The only time chromosomes look like an X is in metaphase. So you may have seen pictures like this. This is a human karyotype. They're also called metaphase spreads. And that's because they come from a cell that's in metaphase. So if you take some cells from somebody, you get them to go through metaphase, you smash them, and look at their condensed chromosomes, then people cut them out, that's why there are these little lines, and put them next to their homolog and make a karyotype that looks like this. So metaphase spread shows you chromosomes that are in metaphase of mitosis. Now I've told you a bunch of information, and this question can be solved with that information. You have to do a little bit of synthesis. So, how many genome copies are present in this human karyotype shown over here? Most of you are not answering correctly, so you may want to talk to your neighbor. It's not really getting better, so I'm going to stop, and I'm going to remind you that this human karyotype is also called a metaphase spread. Okay, I'm going to open the polling again, and I want you to try again. Only a very few people are changing their answer, or at least other people are changing it the wrong way. Okay, click in. Okay, you guys are doing exactly the same thing that previous class did. So most of you have answered A and B, but the correct answer is D. All right, now the reason why the correct answer is D is because this is a metaphase spread. It's from a mitotic cell. Right? So I have one gene, two genes, three genes, four genes. I have four copies of every allele in metaphase. Every gene, thank you. Four copies of every gene, four different alleles or four the same alleles, who knows? You can only have two different alleles. Four genes. So you have four genome copies in my process. 
Now that question was hard. It's exactly the sort of question that could be on an exam. And I'm trying to give you more clicker questions where you guys won't do very well so that you can learn some concepts so you do well on the exams. So don't get discouraged by getting a wrong answer. Okay? Hopefully it will help you learn. Any questions on this or is it clear enough? Yes? How many genomes does a regular cell have? If you mean a somatic cell, each somatic cell is diploid. It has two copies of every gene, two copies of the genome. Anybody else? Yes? Yeah. 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 Okay. So we'll go quickly through mitosis again. Maybe writing it out this way will make it clearer how many genome copies there are. So when a somatic body cell divides by mitosis, it starts out two ends, diploid. It has two genome copies. So here n is the number of copies of the genome. It's going to go through S phase. What does the S stand for? Synthesis. Synthesis. So DNA replication and S phase are the same. DNA replication occurs during S phase. 4N. So once you duplicate the 2N, you end up with four copies of the genome, like in those metaphase chromosomes. Now we're going to go through mitosis. And mitosis divides that 4N into two cells that are 2N. So you go from diploid to diploid. You create two daughter cells that are exact clones. Now one of the things we said we needed to get done with meiosis was reducing the DNA content of the cell. So the gamete forming cell that's going to undergo meiosis also starts out diploid with two copies of the genome. It also goes through S phase and replicates its DNA. Then it becomes 4N. It has four copies of every gene, four copies of the genome. But now, instead of going through mitosis, it's going to go through meiosis. And instead of dividing into two cells, it's going to take that 4N and divide it into four gametes, each of which are haploid. So each gamete will have one genome copy, so there's another individual who's also had gametes produced by meiosis. And when those haploid gametes fuse, you get back to 2N. So you started out 2N, and you end up 2N, which is how you want to survive as a species. So that's good. So it's only when you want to combine genetic and material from two individuals that you want to decrease the DNA content. So the only cells in your body that undergo meiosis are the cells that make gametes. Every other cell in your body only does mitosis if it divides. The other thing that people often forget is that DNA replication precedes meiosis, just like it precedes mitosis. Okay, so I'm going to show you in class this top video as long as it works. It's a little bit fast, but you can watch it later. This is a hyperlink. In prophase 1, the DNA coils tightly and individual chromosomes become visible under the light microscope. Homologous chromosomes become closely associated in synapses and they exchange segments by crossing over. By metaphase 1, the nuclear membrane has disappeared and the microtubules form a spindle. Spindle fibers attach to only one side of each centromere, and the two homologous chromosomes attach to microtubules orienting from opposite poles. Each pair of homologs then lines up on the metaphase plate. Either maternal or paternal homolog may orient toward a given pole. In anaphase 1, the microtubules of the spindle fiber shorten and pull the chromosomes toward the poles, taking both sister chromatids with them. Each pole ends up with a complete haploid set of chromosomes consisting of one member of the homologous pair. During telophase 1, the nuclear membrane reforms around the daughter nuclei. Each daughter nucleus contains two sister chromatids for each chromosome attached to a common centromere. Because of crossing over, the two sister chromatids are not identical. During prophase 2, the nuclear envelope breaks down and a new spindle forms. In metaphase 2, spindle fibers bind to both sides of the centromeres. During anaphase 2, the spindle fibers contract and the sister chromatids move toward opposite poles. 
In telophase 2, nuclear envelopes reform around the set of daughter chromosomes. Okay, so you can see from this that at the end you get four cells that have one, two chromosomes. And back at the beginning when we started, we had one cell that had one, two, three, four chromosomes. So we've reduced the number of chromosomes by half. The other thing I wanted to ask you was here where the, micro the chromosomes are going to opposite poles. What's pulling the chromosomes? Dynein. Remember your demo? Okay, dynein is pulling the chromosomes to the opposite poles. Okay, back to the lecture. So I'm not going to show you the unique features of meiosis video just based on time, but it's really nice. If you guys want to watch it, please do. All right, we're going to try a demonstration for which I need four brave volunteers to illustrate the process of my meiosis. One, two, Three. Anybody over here? Four. Okay, come on down. Okay, so I need where's my, my fourth? Okay, so you guys go stand over there. You can come here for a sec. You can come here. You're going to be the first. So we're going to go through the process. If you can stand up to the side, so you guys are going to be singles in a sec. So we're going through the process of gametogenesis. So this is our gamete forming cell. I've given it two chromosomes. So one homologous chromosome pair. Okay, this cell is in, thank you very much. This cell is in G1. Okay, it's hanging out. So what's going to happen now that it's ready to start making gametes? What has to happen first? Synthesis. I love that answer. Okay, so the first thing that happens is we're going to copy that DNA. Now, why don't the chromosomes condense first? Very good, because you need access. This is a smart gamete forming cell. Okay, so you would not condense the chromosomes until after they're replicated. So now we've synthesized new DNA. So don't forget S phase precedes meiosis. Now, part of the reason why I'm using ribbon is because it shows you it's all sloppy and it gets tangled and it's a mess. So you wouldn't want to really divide chromosomes that look like this. It would be a challenge. So the next thing we're going to do is condense. That's right. So I'm going to relieve you of these ugly, messy chromosomes and provide you with nice condensed chromosomes. Yeah. It was hard to get this many water noodles the same color. So hope you appreciate it. Okay, so now we still have two chromosomes. We've gone through S phase, so we have twice as much DNA. How many genome copies do we have? Four. Four genome copies. These two are sister chromatids. They have the same genetic loci, the same genes, in the same order. Do they have the same alleles? Yes. Yes. Do the blue and the green have the same alleles? No. no. They are non-sister chromatids. Very good. Okay, so we condense them. Now, the first interesting thing that is meiosis specific is what? Yeah. Okay, I'm hearing some crossing over, but what has to happen before they cross over? Synapsis. Very good. So put them in synapsis for me. Yes, they're touching. So there are proteins that hold those chromosomes together. Now remember, you guys can watch this later, so you volunteers will not be uh, disenfranchised. You can watch this later, so you get to know. Okay? All right. So they're held together by proteins in synapsis. When they enter into synapsis, the genes are lined up. So the favorite ice cream flavor gene here is lined up with the favorite ice cream flavor gene here. That's really important because when they cross over, they're going to swap homologous segments. They need to switch the same genes, right? So the chromosomes and synapses have to line up and they're not exactly the same. Okay, so we've got that. Now we're going to do what? Crossover. This is harder to figure out exactly how to do it, so I have to 
to sub in a new chromosome for you. Okay, so now we still have our two chromosomes. Are the sister chromatids still the same alleles? Oh. No. No. Now that they cross over, the sister chromatids don't have the same sequence anymore. This blue piece and this green piece, that are the socks, do they contain the same genes? Yes. 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 The alleles were swapped between the chromosomes, but they're switching the same set of genes. All right, very nice. Now we get the spindle starting to form, so you can be my first spindle. Come on over and attach. Where should we attach? The centromere right on one or both chromosomes. One. Okay, so you're the other spindle. Each of you attached to one chromosome. Uh-huh. Yep, you get one. Okay, so now we go through anaphase. After they're aligned with the metaphase play, we go through anaphase. Back up, both of you. All right, meiosis one, very nice. They've gone to opposite poles. So now we have two daughter cells. They each have one chromosome instead of two, and we've halved the amount of DNA. However, these two daughter cells still have one, two. Alleles of each gene are not haploid yet. So we still need to do more. That means we're going to go to meiosis two. Oh, for just a second. It's really fast to check it online. In Camtasia, you can just go straight to the slide and we'll see what I put up there. Okay? So, part two. Don't work. Part two. What doesn't happen before meiosis two? No DNA synthesis. Very good. No DNA synthesis. Now we have prophase. Pretty boring. The spindle forms. So, my two spindles here will go attach. So, they're going to each attach to a sister chromatid. And they're going to line up on the metaphase plate where they already are. Now we're going to go through anaphase. Anaphase, full, oh, very nice. Okay, separate. We have four. Why don't you come here? Yeah. So we have four daughter cells. Each has one chromosome. They are haploid. They have one copy of each gene. Okay. Are are any of these gametes the same? No, they aren't. Genes have been swapped around, so none has exactly the same sequence. All right, four daughter cells, one copy of each gene in the genome, different combination of alleles. Very good. So you guys can dump your chromosomes and go get your reward from Becca over there. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so on your own. I would like you guys to make a table that compares meiosis and mitosis. There is such a table in your book. But if you just copy down that table, you will not learn as much as if you try and write it down from memory, from what you learn. So please make that for yourselves. Now you guys remember this slide from back in the beginning. It seems simple then. Now I'm going to ask you a clicker question see if you guys get the concepts that we just went over. So the question is, if these two individuals mate, this person and this person, how many alleles will each of their offspring have at the favorite ice cream flavor locus? Okay, click in if you haven't. Very good. All right, let's see what you guys think. That's good. You guys did a little bit better than section A. So the correct answer is B. And they had a similar pattern where they were kind of evenly distributed between the other possibilities. Why is the answer B? Because we're all diploid. The offspring will all be diploid. And that means that they're going to have two alleles of every gene. Sometimes people get confused because there's three alleles between these two individuals. But each person can only have two alleles of the gene. So the answer is definitely two. Any questions or is that clear? Okay, so one goal of meiosis was to reduce the DNA content of the cell. A second goal of meiosis was to mix it up, to make new gene combinations. So now we're going to go through the two ways 
that meiosis increases genetic diversity. So in this case, we have a cell that, like our cell on stage here, had one pair of homologous chromosomes. It has one that it got from its mom and one from its dad. It's going to undergo meiosis. And in this case, there are two crossovers. For simplicity, I only showed you one crossover, but in this case, there are two. So this segment of the maternal chromosome was swapped with this segment of the paternal chromosome, and over here, this segment of the maternal chromosome was swapped with this part of the paternal chromosome. After this cell goes through meiosis one and meiosis two, you'll end up with four distinct gametes. So all four gametes were different, and crossing over can occur at a different spot in each different meiotic division. So there's no fixed spot where crossing over has to occur. Plus, each pair can cross over between one and three times. So you can get lots of genetic diversity from crossing over. But there's, oh, question. Okay, so before we go on to the second way, crossing over between sister chromatids would increase the genetic diversity of the gametes. Crossing over between sister chromatids would increase the genetic diversity of the gametes. Okay, choose your answer. You guys are also like A here, but you did a little bit better. Sister chromatids, do they have the same genes? Yes. Sisters have the same genes, right? Sisters have the same genes. Non-sisters have the same genes. Sisters also have the same alleles. So you're not going to increase genetic diversity if you just switch an apple for an apple, right? If they're exactly the same, then crossing over isn't going to matter. There's no increased diversity. So only non-sister chromatids cross over because non-sister chromatids have different alleles. So the answer to this question is false. So now, the second way that we get diversity, or recombination, is by how the chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate during meiosis one. So in this example, there's no crossing over. So you can see the contribution just from how the chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate. So here we have a cell that's a little bit more complicated so that we can get the point across. It has three pairs of homologous chromosomes. So one, two, three, four, five, six chromosomes. And it got three of those from the mom, three of those from the dad. And in this particular case, they lined up so all the mom chromosomes are on the top and all the dad chromosomes are on the bottom. And that means you can produce these sorts of gametes because the homologous chromosomes will separate, remember, in meiosis one and then they'll divide again. So all the moms will go together, all the dads will go together. But it doesn't have to be that way. Each time it's a coin flip. Is the mom chromosome up here or down here? It's like flipping a coin. In this case, you've got mom, mom, dad. So now you can produce a different set of DNAs. In another case, you might have mom, dad, mom. And you could make a different set of DNAs. And finally, you could have mom, dad, dad. Then you could make another set of gametes. So it's random how the mom, the maternal and paternal chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate. In this example, where we have three homologous chromosomes, we're doing three coin flips. So two to the third gave us eight possible gametes. Now you guys have how many homologous chromosome pairs? 23. Right? So now we're going to do 2 to the 23rd power, 23 coin flips. You can get 8.4 million possible answers. So you can make a lot of different gametes just from how the chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate. So the final thing here is going to be a little bit of problem solving. This is a mule. You guys are going to tell me why mules are sterile. 
Ligers and wall fins are also sterile for similar reasons. What are wall fins? Look it up on Google. <laughs> well, it's all fins. Okay, so what is a mule? I'm a veterinarian, I know what mules are. A mule is a cross between a horse and a donkey. Why would you want to do such a crazy thing? Well, mules are big and strong like horses, but they're tough like donkeys, and they don't need fancy food, and they don't get hurt as easily. So mules are a very useful animal to have. A horse has 62 chromosomes, and a donkey has 64. Okay, so I want you to tell me with your clickers how many chromosomes that mule has. Please read ahead, okay? 